Aloha all. You've reached Samana with Unconventional Insights. This is my episode number 13. And we're calling this Grounding and Stabilizing Practices. We are entering our fall season, although at 90-something degrees in Texas, it doesn't feel like it yet. Energetically, it feels like fall. Temperature-wise, it doesn't. So I want to give a few tips to help us enter this season of holidays coming and the end of the year. Now, I've seen by nature, working with people in counseling uh, and clients for so many years, students and all that, somehow um, the, the nature of this time of year can be a little more pressure on people, uh, again, because it's holidays and who am I sharing time with and issues of loneliness come up or, or material expenses come up or just it's coming to the end of the year and have I really achieved what I wanted to this year? So m- many thoughts come up and the nature of the end of the year is it's actually a more uh, contracted time. There is actually kind of more of a pressure as it's coming to a close. The year is coming to a close and it, we're now almost in October in a couple of days and and then it will be over in no time. We'll be in 2020. How about that? Anyway, so I want to do a little guided meditation that I call body scan, just for any of you out there. Hopefully you're not driving and listening to this. So just, if you can, close your eyes and take a couple of deep breaths. (sighs) Inhale, exhale, and just really feel your body for a minute. And this is where we're going to bring our awareness, which is the subtle mind, And we're going to start at the top of the head and we're going to scan coming down the front of the face and feeling any pressure or temperature or sensations and just noticing around the forehead and the eyebrows and the eyes. Is there any pressure? Is there any blinking? Is there any movement happening? Just noticing, not like with a harsh mind, just a subtle noticing mind. Coming down the bridge of the nose and noticing our breathing. If we notice our breathing coming in and out of the nostrils, do we feel the warmth on our upper lip? Scanning down the sides of the cheeks and through the mouth area, noticing if there's any tension or pressure there. Noticing if you're gritting your teeth or is it just nice and relaxed. We tend to hold lots of pressure in our face. Scanning down the throat, through the shoulders, noticing if our shoulders are raised or are they nice and relaxed. Scanning down the arms all the way to the fingertips. Noticing as we scan the various areas of the body, is there sensation, is there tingling? Do we feel the aliveness as the mind is giving it attention? Scanning back up the arms, down the front of the body. Noticing the heartbeat, the rhythm of the breath, how the breath comes in and out of the lungs, how the rib cage expands. Noticing the belly, does the breath rise and fall? Where does the breath get tracked in the body? Noticing if you're holding your stomach tense or if it's nice and relaxed. Again, no judgment here, just noticing how you hold your body when you bring attention to it, just being curious about it. Scanning down through the pelvis area, noticing how you're sitting on the chair or the ground, how the ground supports you. Scanning down the legs, the thighs, the knees, the calves, the ankles to the tips of the toes. Taking a breath, scanning back up the legs to the base of the spine. And as we gently scan up the spine, noticing is there any tight, any sharp, any sensation? 
Are we leaning to one side? Do we favor one side of the body? Just be so curious about how we are, how this body rests in scanning up the neck to the top of the head again. Taking a breath. Enjoying that. And that's just a quick little meditation body scan. Now, using meditation, it's one of our best tools for grounding and, and stabilizing. And many people feel that meditation is some mystical thing. It's not. It's basically just learning to focus and direct your mind onto a specific area. So there's a term called anchoring. So we want to actually anchor the mind and give it something to do. And what, how we do that is we allow it to notice the breathing and track where the breathing, how the beginning of the breath, the ending of the breath, the middle of the breath, where we notice the sensation most, at the nostrils, in the chest, at the belly. If we notice any sensations in the body, many times I've done retreats with so much pain in my back or my neck or shoulder or something, and that wonderful pain sensation became a great focus of concentration practice in my meditation. So again, just looking at the pain gently, seeing the edges of it, if there's a color to it, if there's a tightness in my chest, what is the color, what is the texture, does it move, is it stationary? Noticing so much about the body. And also as an anchor, we bring in sound. I could hear the birds and the wind chime in the background, sometimes the dogs barking hearing the sound of my voice. So it's near sounds and far sounds, they say. And we're not really reaching for the sound to hold it. We're just noticing and allowing it through the ears. So other ways that we ground and we anchor ourselves that bring a stability about us is we have friends and family that help to ground us. And it's interesting that every relationship you have in life, be it if it's a romantic love partnership or a family member or a close friend or your child or your pet, that there's a, an alchemy that happens. There's actually an energy exchange between the two of you that it only creates that specific alchemy when the two of you are together. And therefore, both of you are different in that moment. And no two people or animal or circumstance or environment is alike so each place we're in it creates a different feeling and notice how there are some people that you call because you want to be inspired or you want to talk about some new thought processes or or questions or philosophy that you want to come up with and then the conversations are endless and hours pass on the phone or together and and you just feel so inspired and then there are other people that when you're feeling down or you need someone that believes in you, that that's their emotional support and that's how they anchor you as they do the, it's going to be okay, you're doing a great job, we need our cheerleaders. And then we have those connections that are just for fun. I just need life to not be so serious right now. I just want to laugh. I want to goof off. I want to like go for a hike and do something fun and laugh, watch a comedy together, anything. So, so we have different people that play different parts in our life and to just acknowledge that and know and utilize that because that is a tool to help us when we need it. Even if it's that person, like I have so many of my students and friends and clients from like 20, 30 years ago that out of nowhere I get a text or an email and then I'm like, let's chat for a few minutes. We either text or email or actually talk and it just, it feels like you've never missed any time together. You're just right there because you have that particular connection with them and it's a beautiful thing. So in grounding practices, so we're the, the nature of mind. So we'll talk about this. I, I bring this up a lot. So not only is healthy food and nutrition wonderful and necessary for the body, 
And now that we're getting into the fall, having more root vegetables are good. As the weather changes wherever you are and it gets cooler, like your any of your root vegetables are very good. There's wonderful recipes out there to help that. Or just bake a sweet potato and put a little butter on it and things like that. Because those are grounding. That helps to ground you. So people that have spinning minds or always distracted in thought and various things, I've often changed their diet to be more uh, hearty, like have a steak, have something that's more substantial. With some people, have a whole grain bread, something that's more filling instead of salads and fruits. Those tend to be a little more airy. So in redirecting the mind, so, so the mind Its nature is, I always describe that it's like a satellite dish. So the mind is a satellite dish, and we actually can, when we choose to direct it, we can focus it on whatever we want to. Oftentimes, we allow the mind to be in charge of itself, and that's like saying, here's a three-year-old, and I'm going to let you do whatever you want. It will be chaos, and that's what happens with the mind. The nature of mind is to dissect and separate everything. That's, that's its nature, is to see things in categories, in separateness, in steps. And when it's unharnessed and not directed, and we have the mind looking at ourselves, this is where we get into self-destruct. So if you are a person that you tend to self-destruct and pick yourself apart, Just know in that moment that your mind needs to be redirected in a healthy way because it shows that you have a powerful mind, but unfortunately it's not supposed to be directed at yourself. Or if you tend to be highly critical or judgmental of other people, again, this is your mind out of control and we need to direct it into another area. The mind is never content or happy. So when we use our awareness, and our awareness is collect is connected to everything, to everyone, to all sentient beings, it's the if you, God, spirit, everything. The highest, the highest outcome is our awareness. It's the subtle mind. It's the mind that notices. And when I say notice, it's because it's like if you're looking off to the side of your peripheral view and you just notice off to the side there's a subtle movement so that is how I want to use the mind not a sharp dissecting hard angle mind I want a gentle more of a mindful perspective like panning the camera back so you see the whole view instead of a speck of the view so when you Pull the mind back to see the whole perspective. You're in an area of your awareness directing your mind. So there is a term that we could say redirect the mind or pivot the mind. So I've had clients that say that they have negative thought processes all the time. And negative thinking comes up about themselves, their partner, whatever life. It's never going to end. And notice... Eventually, we want to get to a point where we are not thinking negative thoughts. But in the meantime, if we could just commit to ourselves that when we think of that negative thinking, that we learn to pivot it, meaning right there, I just said something negative, like nothing's going to change in my life right now, no matter how hard I try. And in that moment, if I could bring my kindness, my awareness to myself, I'm going to add that I am making a lot of steps towards changing my life or I treat myself so well with the way that I eat with the way that I exercise so when there is a negative thought pivot by adding to it what is the positive that you're doing and try to start using that as a tool and eventually you won't even say the initial negative thoughts or statements and we start to redirect the mind. So if you think of the mind as a child, as I said, here's this little three-year-old going crazy and nobody's in charge. And what are the ways? So let me show you the nature of mind. So any of you that have been parents out there or grandparents and you have a small child that's acting out, 
in old school, we'd smack them or yell at them or something. And then we've learned through the generations that does nothing but shame someone and eventually children start wanting negative attention because of that. So then their whole life they act out because they know either way they're going to get your attention if it's hitting or hugging. So we don't want to do that. But the healthy way to reprimand a child is if they're doing something wrong, let's say they're screwing with the cat or they're, they're tearing up their books or something, then we're going to go in there and we're going to say, oh, did you see this toy over here? Or come and look at the bird outside with me. So you instantly get their attention on a whole new area, a whole new focus. And they totally forget about the destructive programming they were doing. So this is a similar thing. I used to ride horses a lot when I was 11, 12, 13. I lived on a farm. I loved it. And again, when you're riding a horse, the horse can tell who's in charge. So you're riding this horse, and let's say that it's going over to eat the apples off the tree, or it's going to do what it wants. And for you to like be harsh with the horse or try to jerk it away... It's going to fight you because it's a strong animal. But if the horse is going in a direction you don't want it to, you just take the reins and go in the opposite direction with a little bit of pressure on the sides with your feet, with your legs, just so the horse knows you're in charge, that you're present, that you're right there guiding it. And we're just redirecting it. Look at this direction. Same when you're training puppies on a leash. And you're going for walks and they're sniffing everything and going in every direction. And again, you don't yank on the leash like we would with the mind because that's not going to do anything. But you redirect it. Let's walk over here. So you actually turn in a circle so that you, you are in charge of the puppy. You turn in a circle. So any of you needing horse riding or puppy training or children training, there, you just got that tip also. Anyways, but we're doing the same thing with the mind. So we're acting firmly yet gently and redirecting to a new focus. So when the symptoms come up of negative thinking, redirect it. Give it a focus. I mean, sometimes I'm in such an uh, overwhelming thought process that either I'll take a book and start reading because I just need like a commercial break. I just need to stop thinking. Or I'll put on one of my TV shows that I love or a movie and that becomes re refocusing it. I'm not saying to live in books or TV or online, but I'm saying sometimes you could use it as a healthy practice. Again, meditation is a wonderful thing, but it's hard at times to use meditation if your mind is very active, of just a sitting meditation. It's hard unless you're a skilled practitioner to use that as a way of calming your thoughts. Now, I can do it when I'm in a frenzy oftentimes. But another practice of meditation is a walking meditation, which I love. And again, you could do that in your living room, in your bedroom. You could do it. I like doing it outside. And again, where you're just walking very slowly. So you're lifting the foot. And you could even say to yourself, lifting, moving, placing. You lift the other foot, lifting, moving, placing. So you're walking very slow and mindfully, and all of your attention is at your feet, where you're feeling the pressure. You're noticing as you lift the foot, move the foot, place the foot. And how does the foot land? How does it come down? Does it come down at more towards the toes or towards the ankle, towards the heel of the foot? Is it more on the instep or the outstep? Do you notice when you place the left foot versus the right foot? Do you tend to favor more pressure on one foot over the other? So again, giving your mind that ability to focus on noticing as you walk. And as I'm walking, I'm aware that I'm breathing, just natural breathing. And I'm also taking in sounds. And if there's slight wind or or rain or something happening around me. So you take all that in. So oftentimes, if the mind's very busy, walking meditation is wonderful. Other tools that you could do is, if you've heard of mala beads or like a rosary, it's a similar thing. 
So there are mantras you could say, like Omani Padme Hum. There's so many mantras, you could look it up. And what those are for is basically while you're doing the beads. So I actually have mala beads in my car. And I do this every day that I leave in my car to go to the gym or go somewhere. That it's my first thing. I turn off the music and everything and I start with my mala beads. So what you're doing is you're bringing in two types of anchoring. The sensation of moving each bead at a time. So I could actually track that with the touch in my hand of the beads. And then my mind is focusing either on the mantra so that it doesn't think other thoughts. So it's saying, Omani Padme Hum. You could say it out loud. You could say it silently. Or whatever is powerful for you. Again, with rosaries, there's prayers and things. It's the same. It's all the same principle as to keep the mind focused. So you can do that. Now, one thing that I started doing months ago, which I love and I share with others, is that when I... Am doing so maybe I'll do a whole like 108 beads of my malas and I'll do the um, one of the mantras and then I decide to do where I want to bring it into a feeling state so it anchors it in my body so one bead I'll feel and I'll say the word to myself gratitude and I take a moment what does gratitude feel like in my body then I do appreciation as the next bead. What does appreciation feel like in my body as I'm breathing? Then love. What does love feel like in my body? Inspiration. What does inspiration feel like in my body? Compassion. I could feel the heart expanding. What does that feel like in my body? Receptivity. Again, one bead, one emotion, feeling it in my body, thinking it vitality abundance. You could come up with so many different words and I often go back to gratitude and appreciation because that feels so good in the body and love and to feel that how love is so expansive, so beyond our skin and bones. It's just so beautiful. I love that. Anyways, so what else do we have? So in talking about also other practices that can help to ground us and anchor us when the mind is not doing so well for us is there's an eating practice which is a type of med meditation so I've worked with people with eating disorders and or they can't get over certain food cravings that they know are bad for them um, so take whatever food that you're is your thing you're addicted to that you like or don't like that's good for you or not good for you is what I mean and so you take it you bring it you smell it you do this very much like a meditation you taste it you chew it you notice how the saliva comes in the mouth you swallow it you feel it going down the throat you notice it as it goes into the stomach again noticing every little step of this and while you're eating this, and again, taking another bite, smelling it, noticing what the mouth does before you actually put it in your mouth, doing this very slowly, I say do it like a love affair. And then noticing a few moments later, keep tracking the body, like is your body feeling revitalized? Like does it give it energy with what you're eating? Or do you notice that you're shoulders kind of slump over or that your stomach feels a little tight or you just feel tired you start to feel fatigued so you can do this practice this awareness practice with eating you could do it while you're speaking to people to see if certain people are are beneficial if they add to your energy or they deplete your energy you could notice this when you're in certain types of environments like when I go to the mall and it's too distractive sometimes, I actually have to put on my little my little cloaking device. I have a direction. I go in. I'm in and out. I don't like big, busy, loud environments. I can do it, and I can do it and be balanced, but it's not my preference. But to notice all the time and ask yourself, is this adding to my energy or is it depleting my energy? Am I finding that I have to protect my heart or is my stomach getting tense? Or am I noticing my breath is shallow? So using those sorts of, of insights to see and help guide yourself onto a, 
a better path. Also, essential oils. I teach a few classes in aromatherapy that I just love. So grounding oils, for these are great for therapists, for coaches, for social workers, for uh, whatever, it, just our own personal use. Now, some of my favorite ones, the like the the king of them all is a one, one called spikenard. So any of my students out there know this one. So spikenard actually smells like a locker room to me. It's very earthy, very um, um, blatant in smell. It's not subtle in any way. And spikenard is used to, to help clear away, like if there's heart palpitations, if there's... Um, if there's high blood pressure, it's good for that also. If you're feeling energetically attacked or if you need protection, they say that spikenard was one of the oils that anointed Jesus's robes when he ascended. So that was one that was scientifically tracked. So spikenard's very good. Now, when I've worked with intense clients in counseling, I actually keep a little bottle of it in my pocket or on my table and I'll just take a smell, one smell, and then I allow it to like, protect me and clear me out. Sage is also a wonderful essential oil. Same thing for people that are working with a lot of intense energy or in intense environments or say you're in, you know, in IT or in an office area and it may not be so healthy. Bring your sage and smell that throughout the day. Just clear it out. In that one second, you're saying, okay, I'm clearing this out as well as it's decoding the brain and it's bringing that ground. Nutmeg's another grounding one. Vetiver. Vetiver is excellent because it's an earth water oil. And that one specifically is very good for like um, frazzled thinking where the mind is spinning a lot. And so vetiver is a nice grounding one and it's excellent for the skin. So, or any of the trees are grounding. So those have kind of a earth air to it. So those help with grounding you and bringing insights. So like spruce or pine. So try any of those. You could get those at any of your H-E-B or health food stores. or They're, they're wonderful. And remembering to be uh, compassionate to yourself. And if you do your daily self-care tools, and I'm giving this podcast every week to you, I'm always going to, sometimes I'm going to repeat myself, and sometimes I'm going to give you new little little ringer tricks that will help you. And the more we care for ourselves, the more we could be available to others. And as things get more intense, and I had a friend say, is something going on in 2019? Why does everyone seem so off? I say with compassion, it makes us have to do our inner work more so that I can be more stable, more of an anchor to those like yourself and others out there that need it. So be that anchor to someone, but first be it to yourself. Now I'm going to give my little, um, my little pitches of my workshops. So my specialty thing, I would say this is my crowning jewel is because I've done it for over 25 years and I've taught it in various ways and I finally have it distilled where this is a certification that is specifically for anyone in the coaching field, estheticians, massage therapists, trainers. Um, and what it is, is I call it a total client renovation certification where again, I talk to you about specific diet and I put you on a cleanse for 30 days in a, in a certain way, very specific eating. It's basically eliminating all the allergens. And then we go over mental and emotional detox. And it's a total package where you actually uh, do quite the renovation where that client is transformed if they're coming at you with high blood pressure or depressions or anxieties or, or weight issues or, uh, you know, relationship issues or, you know, erectile dysfunction or whatever. I have worked with so many different things and this whole crux of everything I've taught for so many years with clients and students, it really works. So that one, I do it where we check in. So I'm going to send you all the information. It, I charge a thousand dollars for this. And right now I'm doing a special for only $500 until January. And I only take a handful of people each month, each 30 days. And it doesn't matter where you're at. 
because we could do this online. Most of my people don't live in Austin, Texas. So we will, you're going to, I'm going to send you all the information by email. You're going to start on the cleanse and then our first appointment will be about five to seven days in on the cleanse. And you're going to have access to me texting, emailing, calling, any questions that come up for you. And you're going to take great notes so that you could help others when they come up with these things as the body transitions through this, as you get clarity, as you notice as the liver's cleaning out, what mental things, and then all of the tools you're going to help with them. But we're going to meet um, online for two hours each week, the same day every week, and I'm going to do some teachings and trainings, and we're going to do some exercises together, some meditations and movement and various things and all of these are for you to offer to your clients and then it does come with the certification that I will give you at the end. So I love that one and then I have three aesthetician workshops coming up October 7th microneedling in South Austin, October 14th microdermabrasion with oxygen facials and October 21st is dermaplaning. Now I only take 10 students tops and uh, that is in South Austin I take a $100 deposit and then you could pay the balance in the class and you could get more information if you like by calling or texting me 808-283-7587 or my website spaluna, S-P-A-L-U-N-A dot com. And I am actually going back to Maui for a visit in January and I am on January 13th, Monday, I am doing microneedling slash nano needling because microneedling and nano is legal and not legal in some areas. Nano is legal to all estheticians, all cosmetologists because you're not penetrating the skin. So I actually show both of those. And with that one, I'm only taking 10 people that will be in haiku at the Temple of Peace. Shelly has been so gracious to offer her space there. And again, contact me directly if you're interested. That's $250, and I'm taking $125 as a non-refundable deposit ahead. And if you know of anyone that's interested, always share these podcasts, please. And then one last thing, in my Be a Relationship Architect workshop with David Garrison. So excited about that. We're turning that into an intensive November 16th and 17th. So that's Saturday and Sunday from 10 to 5. It includes a healthy lunch because I'm all about that healthy lunch. And that is $400. That we're taking 12 people in. I already have people signed up, but there's still spots left. And if you pay, we have an early bird special of $350 if you pay by October 16th. And I started a meetup, a Be a Relationship Architect meetup. We did it last uh a week ago, and we're only doing that once a month, so our next one is October 8th if you're in South Austin, and that will be from 6.45 to 8.45, and we're going to talk about love languages in depth and then do some fun interactive exercises, so that's exciting. So please tell friends that this benefits, and um, I so love these podcasts. I hope that it benefits you and many. And aloha and blessings.